So the missing element here is that this is half of distributivity. This is the distributive property with respect to the sum of two vectors. But what about with respect to multiplication by a scalar? So there is this additional property, which is also part of distributivity, which I'll write here and I'll erase in a moment, that if you take A and B and you multiply A by a number, then the result is multiplying the inner, the inner product by that same number. So the way I can capture it is this. So I'll sneak in beta here. And so I have to put in beta here. So I already used this more general distributivity, not more general, more complete. When I said that when you flip a sign on one of the vectors, that the result will be minus the original answer. So that does not follow unless you have this more general thing. But I just wanted to say distributivity and keep it simple. That was really my goal. So we'll have two vectors in R3, A and B. And their, and their entries are A1, A2, A3, and B1, B2, B3. You guys are cool with that? And then how about this definition? 3, A1, B1, plus 4, A2, B2, plus, I'll just keep it simple, A3, B3. Now we'll come back and talk about what makes this an inner product. It is an inner product. It does satisfy these three axioms. You just kind of have to make sure. I think two of them are, well, all three of them are obvious, aren't they? Should we just mentally make sure? You know, clearly, well, let's do one example and then I think all will become a little bit more clear. So let's multiply one, two, three by two minus one minus one. Two good looking vectors. Okay, you guys do it in your heads. I'll do it in mine. Minus five. Okay, it's a number. So we see the first mental check is make sure that it's the sort of thing that takes two vectors and produces a number. It is. Now let's quickly make sure that all of these axioms are satisfied. If I were to reverse these two, would the answer change? Well, just the very mechanics. Of course, it's all the same. You can see how I could have screwed it up writing down the definition. If I had A1, B2 by itself, that's, that would break commutativity. Okay, distributivity, I think, is also obvious. Because you look at each one of these terms and it's clear that each one of them is linear in A and each one of them is linear in B. I don't have A, A by itself, I don't have B by itself, I don't have A squared, I don't have B squared, I don't have any of those, I don't have sine of A. Every term is linear. And then finally, if I dot something with itself, would it necessarily be positive? Let's dot something with itself. Okay, let me do that too. 3, 19, 28. 28. Any chance of making it negative or zero? No chance. Because right? you always get squares. And then you have a sum of squares. So no chance. So of course this holds also. So this is an inner product. That's our first instance of confirming that something is an inner product if you buy into distributivity. Okay, very good. What's the length of this vector with respect to this inner product? Square root of 28. Everybody's cool with that? And do you see how the length of the square of this vector is not the sum of squares like you're used to if you're coming from physics? Or did I successfully kick you out of physics? You still there? Okay. A little more work. <laughs> you're remaining. Uh, Okay, square root of 28. Okay, let me give you these two. What's the, what's the answer? Zero. How would you characterize these two vectors then? These two vectors are, everybody at the same time? I agree, orthogonal. 
You guys sounded like a choir. Okay, they're orthogonal with respect to this inner product. So the point that I really want to, two points that I really want to get across is treat all objects on their own terms, and two, the inner, an inner product is whatever you want it to be. These are your only constraints. Okay, now I will start throwing things out that are not in a product. So I'm giving away the answer. And you will have to tell me why it's not in a product. Are you ready? Well, maybe I want to take away that I've given you the answer. Maybe I'll sneak in something that isn't in a product. <laughs> I started with a somewhat subtle one, but this is not an inner product. Which one is violated? So I, I went right at the subtlest part of this whole list. That is not an inner product. S subtle, but very important. You know, it's the subtle peripheral cases that sometimes end up being the most important. This, this part you're questioning? Okay, let's try it. What was one, two, three times one, two, three? Or was it one, whatever, we'll do it, we'll do it again. One, two, three, it's good that we'll test it. So that, you know, even with the beta in here, these look pretty simple. So actually going through the mechanics of first evaluating this side and then evaluating this side, you know, I combine the two into one, is helpful. So what is one, two, three dotted with one, two, three? Uh, 3 plus 16, 19. We agree? Okay. 19. I will now multiply this by 3. What is the answer now? 57. Let's see. 9 plus 46. 9 plus 46, 57. So this was three times this. Now is this three times this? So it's holding. So it's holding, okay. And it's not at all surprising. Yes. Oh, another flaw? Okay, so let's dot the I on this one. So this part holds. Distributivity holds. And again, distributivity, you should just eyeball it and see linear in A, linear in B, good. So you can't really argue with distributivity. You can kind of test it, you know, and if you doubt it at all, if you're vague about it at all, go through the mechanics. So sometimes it's very helpful to forget about the big picture and just focus on the very, very letter of the law and just do it like you were a dumb computer. And then once you get your dumb computer results, take a human look at it again and you'll see that it holds and you'll feel good, good about it. If you dot zero, zero, 001 with itself, let's see what happens. What do you get? Zero. zero. Does it violate this law? Yes. Who says yes? Who disagrees and says no? Why not? We have an inner product defined for R3. It just happens to ignore, right, the last, the last entry. There is no prohibition against that. Yeah, good comment. So he thought there was a mismatch between what this definition is, so it's actually my fault. I should have said this is for vectors that belong to R3. Actually, I'm allergic to even this symbol. I don't like any formal math symbol, so even this one. You know, I think it's, if you're writing a book, it's better to say belongs or is in. You know, why, why butcher the natural language? But anyway, uh, yeah, my fault. So, okay, that's right, it violates it. So the fact that this is a strict inequality is very important. We cannot afford zero. So that's what positive definite means. That's why the word definite is there. It's definitely positive. Not just not negative, no, it's definitely positive. There is a different word for the sorts of things that could be positive or zero. 
That's called positive semi-definite. So, but definite means definitely not zero. Okay? Correct. Correct. Not an inner product because it violates positive definiteness. And you see how this becomes the most interesting one of them all? Because the rest are kind of easy? Okay, I'll fix it. We fixed positive definiteness, no doubt. Did we break something? Yeah. <laughs> it is against. It, it's irksome. Somebody who hasn't volunteered? Are you? Yes. yes. Yeah, it breaks the distributive law. Right? This is not linear in A or B. Let's talk our way through it for just a moment. We won't actually uh, complete this argument because that's not important, but we'll just sort of see why it's true. But suppose we were attempting, doesn't matter what these numbers are, we were attempting this distributive law. And we said that when we're doing this, right, and we'll compare it to this dotted with this plus this dotted with this. Now without the plus one, distributivity holds, right? But with the plus one, let me write it schematically. Schematically, it's this, right? So without the plus one, the distributive law held, exclamation point. With the plus one, it would be the same thing as it was before, plus one on the left-hand side. And the same thing as it was before, plus one here and plus one here. And so here it'll be what it used to be plus two. So on the left-hand side we have what it used to be plus one, and on the right-hand side it's what it used to be plus two. So no longer holds. So that's how it breaks. But when you look at this, it's just not right. But that's how your intuition that it's not right translates into actually demonstrating that it's not right. Okay, good. How about something like this? Let me stop here for just a moment and pay homage to this particular inner product and say yes, it's a perfectly valid inner product. It comes up all the time. Most linear algebra textbooks for engineers will refer to it as the inner product, as if there is only one. And in my approach to linear algebra, it's highly objectionable. In other approaches to linear algebra, for example, Gil Strang's, and he knows linear algebra far better than I ever will, it's a perfectly legitimate approach. So your job is to know both. So he describes all of linear algebra with this being the inner product. And then he generalizes it later when he has to. That's a perfectly valid approach to linear algebra. In my experience, I kind of had to wrap my mind around this not being the only inner product, and it took me a while. So my favorite approach is to go to, you know, for the arbitrariness of the inner product right away. So you can have your preference. So it does deserve some special attention because the mechanics of matrix multiplication, in some ways you can say it's the dot product and not sound goofy and say it's a dot product of the column with a row, right? You just dot, yeah, so for that reason. And so for that reason, it's called the standard in a product. It's the standard in a product. It is perhaps special in some ways. If you view linear algebra as a pure algebraic tool, then I think it has a special place. I kind of see linear algebra as the interplay between algebra and geometry, in which case it's just one out of many. Okay. Now I'm going to add something to it. Is it still an inner product? The fur, yeah, we broke commutativity, right? Because there is A1, B2 without A2, B1. So let's see, let's see, let's, so we know where the cat is. Let's corner the cat. How about I, I'll take one, zero, zero, 
I certainly want to put zero here because that's not part of the game in this case, right? We just want this interplay between, right? And zero, one, zero. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see what we get. What is A1, B1? Zero. A2, B2? Zero. A3, B3, zero. And A1, B2? One. So the whole answer is one. I will now reverse them. Let's see. A1, B1 is zero. A2, B2. A3, B3. A1, B2. So it's now zero. So do you see how first it was these two that interacted? So they used to be ones. And when you switch them, it's once again these two, and now they're zeros. So we broke symmetry. Is symmetry a good word here? We broke the symmetry between the A's and the B's, and therefore broke commutativity. So commutativity is directly related to the word symmetry. You kind of look at this, right, and you think of 1980s pop. So I'm going to fix it. Did I fix it? Is this an inner product? Yes, 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 yes. Raise your hands if you think it's an inner product. That by fixing, obviously I didn't break distributivity, that by fixing commutativity I didn't break anything else. Okay, who thinks it's, I did break something? Well, there's only positive definiteness left to break. Did I break positive definiteness? <laughs> One person says yes. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. Maybe something will catch your eye. I'm going to dot uh, A, B, C with itself. Uh, let me do X, Y, Z so we don't mix the letters A, B. So let my vector A be X, Y, Z. And maybe you'll notice something. And this sets the stage for a very, very long discussion of positive definiteness. I get it. What is this? X squared. Everybody's on board with me? I just switched the letters on you, so you have to readjust your brain. So X squared, XY, YX. 2XY. Does something, does anything catch your eye? It's a perfect square. Did you guys see that? Perfect square. So, you know, I was a little mean. I picked a very, very subtle borderline case, just like I did before. But this time it was really hidden. So what we're looking at here is x plus y squared, because I can combine these terms, plus z squared. And why is this bad? The sum of squares. To me, the sum of squares sounds like something positive. Here, this is a sum of two squares. So why is it bad? Because x and y's are mixed. They're not x squared plus y squared. And here's how you take advantage of it. So for z, would you agree? Remember, we're dotting something with itself. So for z, we have to take 0. If z is not 0, it's positive. So we have to take 0. Okay, but because x plus y are together in a sum, we can take 1 and minus 1, or 5 and minus. As long as they're opposites, we'll just touch that very edge where the thing is not positive but 0. So I'll just do 1 and minus 1, 1 and minus 1. And here's a vector dotted with itself is 0, and positive definiteness is violated. What we have shown is that this is positive semi-definite. You guys agree with me? We could never push it into the negative territory. But it is not positive definite. Okay, it is positive semi-definite. Okay? Good. <laughs>